Good afternoon. My name is Robert Lamb. I'm a senior fellow and director of the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation here at CSIS. This event is being uh, live cast on the internet at CSIS.org, and the video will be made available afterwards at c3.csis.org. So I'll ask that uh, all of our speakers and anybody who has a question, please make sure the microphone is on when you speak so that uh, everybody watching presently and in the future will be able to hear what you're saying. Um, I am pleased today to be hosting the uh, postponed event. Um, apparently a massive snowstorm hit Washington DC a few weeks back uh, that completely prevented anybody from leaving their houses. And so we had to cancel the event and reschedule it for today. Uh, the upside is that um, Mr. Bowen has had, I believe you've had the opportunity to return to Iraq for what I believe is your 35th trip, 34th trip to Iraq. Uh, and so uh, in addition to hearing Mr. Bowen's uh, uh, sort of final or probably semi-final thoughts uh, on the overall effort in Iraq, uh, we'll also get a bit of an update on the current situation, I think. Um, I wanted to, uh, just by way of introduction, uh, our program, the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation, uh, used to be called the Post-Conflict Reconstruction Project. And 10 years and two months ago, the uh, Post-Conflict Reconstruction Commission at CSIS and the Association of the U.S. Army uh, put out its final report in which it reviewed lessons of previous reconstruction efforts, mainly through the 1990s. And I just wanted to read to you a few of the main findings of that review. This is from January 2003. The people of the country in question must own the reconstruction process and be its prime movers. A coherent international strategy based on internal and external parties' interests is crucial. The international community must address the problem of post-conflict recon um, reconstruction holistically, building and deploying the capacity to address a broad range of interrelated tasks. Security is the sine qua non of post-conflict reconstruction. Though every case is different, there is one constant. If security needs are, are not met, the peace in a given country and the intervention intended to promote it are doomed to fail. Success is made on the ground. International interventions are extraordinary and should take all necessary measures to avoid undermining local leaders, institutions, and processes. Mechanisms are needed to rapidly mobilize and coordinate needed resources and sustain them for appropriate periods of time. Accountability is essential for both host country and international actors. And the timing of an operation must be driven by circumstances on the ground, not by artificial deadlines or externally driven bureaucratic imperatives. Those were the lessons learned in 2003 from um, America's reconstruction experiences up until that point. Uh, today we have learning from Iraq, uh, a final report from the Special Inspector General for Iraq's reconstruction, uh, in which he will be laying out uh, seven final lessons. I'm not going to read all seven because I imagine that, that they will be discussed. Um, but as you listen to Mr. Bowen speak today, uh, I encourage you to think back to the Commission on Post-Conflict Reconstruction from 10 years ago um, and what our program was encouraging people to pay attention to. Um, if you were to create a Venn diagram of lessons learned 10 years ago and lessons learned from the subsequent 10 years, the two circles would overlap quite a bit. Uh, Ray Dubois is going to be introducing Mr. Bowen today. Um, Mr. Dubois is a senior advisor here at CSIS, uh, focusing on international security policy and defense management reform. Um, he's been the acting undersecretary of the Army, um, director of administration and management. Um, for, uh, he's been in the office of the Secretary of Defense. He has been all over the world, um, quite familiar with Iraq. Uh, his bio, along with everyone else's bios, um, are available on your seats. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Dubois to come up and offer some opening remarks uh, as an introduction to Mr. Bowen. Thanks, Ray. As Bob said, my uh, experience with the SIGR goes back to its inception. Uh, when I was the Director of Administration and Management 
uh, for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, before I lay out some remarks, some context, some introductory uh, references to my friend Stuart Bowen, I do want to note that the importance of this, his last, shall we say, public uh, performance, although I suspect there'll be some congressional hearings in the next month uh, in conjunction with his final report. Uh, I note in the audience Judge Webster, our former director of the FBI and director of the Central Intelligence Ag Agency and a senior uh, counselor uh, to CSIS. Thank you, sir, for being here. See one of my former colleagues at the Defense, Jack Shaw, who also served in high uh, office at the State Department. Um, the 19, uh, excuse me, the 2003 bill legislation that created uh, first, the, special, the Inspector General for the Coalition Provisional Authority, uh, and then, uh, which morphed, as we all know, into the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction, was an interesting uh, journey, began an interesting journey, some might call it tortuous. Uh, Senators uh, Feingold and Collins, uh, Russ Feingold and Susan Collins, uh, were put it in the Special Act, uh, that created the $18.4 billion reconstruction, initial reconstruction funding uh, for Iraq. Uh, they created this entity, this creature. It is a creature of the Congress. Congress, inevitably, if you go back even to the Second World War and look at the Senator Harry Truman uh, investigation subsequent to the war, the Congress likes to know where taxpayers' money is going to be spent and whether or not it was spent uh, with some discipline. Uh, I was talking to my wife last night about this particular event today, and uh, it was keying off a comment that we had just heard on the television, uh, leading from behind. And I've decided that uh, Stewart's uh, report ought to be entitled, Not Learning from Iraq, but Learning from Behind. There are a series of recommendations that he will no doubt bring to your attention, uh, which s clearly uh, point out the mistakes, yes, uh, that have been made uh, during uh, the past uh, 10 years, uh, that he and his investigators and, and his auditors uh, uh, have, have brought to our attention, and correctly so. Um, I look at his, uh, his report, and there are a number of different aspects of it that I commend to you. And one that came, comes to my mind as being unique and informative, and perhaps very, very special, is the fact that he went out and interviewed U.S. and Iraqi uh, and other international players on this stage. And they, if you read the report, had some really candid remarks about the entire reconstruction and stability operation in Iraq. Uh, this has never been done before, to my knowledge, and one that I commend Stuart for having uh, entertained. Now, I want to also tell you that Stuart started his career, a young lawyer in Texas, uh, for Governor Bush, then Governor Bush. Uh, he was an assistant attorney general of Texas and also served on Governor Bush's staff in Austin uh, uh, and then came to Washington with the president-elect and worked in the White House for four years until he received the appointment as inspector general for the Coalition Provisional Authority. He leaves that office uh, here in a another month or so. Uh, don't know where he's going, but I'm sure we'll find out soon and soon enough. But I also wanted to share with you all the fact that the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction did not uh, go unnoticed to a number of other agencies in the government. It had its critics. It had its critics inside the executive branch. It had its critics uh, on the Hill, it had its critics in the media. Uh, so one has to recognize, however, that anything in this town that is done with discipline, that is done, that provides a result, 
that is done with a quantitative set of analyses will always find critics. But I think it is also important to recognize the context that the Inspector General and his staff worked in. Uh, Stewart refers to it as oversight under fire. Uh, there's no question that that created situation unlike any other. I think it probably bears repeating that, remember in World War II, we had 10 to 12 at any given time million men and some women in uniform. What was the difference in Iraq? We had an equal number of contractors on the battlefield as we had soldiers, as we had military personnel. We also had some 4,500 Department of the Army civilians in country at its height. This was, shall we say, an expeditionary auditing environment, one that we had never experienced before. Uh, as I indicated, Congress uh, likes to have their own fellow on the ground. They created that with Stewart, uh, and Stewart and his team uh, held true to their charter. But that's another interesting aspect of this story. That charter kept getting renewed. There was once a period of time, after the first year, I think it was, where Stewart was left with, it was, he was supposed to go out of existence. And I think it would, they were uh, drawing down to some 15 or less people. Now Congress, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to renew its charter and continue to do so uh, now these nine years later. Um, one ought to recognize also the complexity of the situation in Iraq, especially going back to 2003 and 2004. As you will remember, the Coalition Provisional Authority, established by the National Security Presidential Decision Memorandum 36, I think it was, uh, put the Secretary of Defense in charge, and it said quite explicitly in the NSPD that the Secretary of State and other cabinet members and agency heads would support the Secretary of Defense. Uh, this became, uh, shall we say, the most complex management chart I have ever seen. When Ambassador Negroponte became ambassador uh, in Baghdad, subsequent to the stand down of the Coalition Provisional Authority, Secretary Rumsfeld turned to me and he said, I need to better understand how decisions are made with respect to reconstruction, stabilization operations, etc." I said, all right, give me 24 hours and I will do a chart. I didn't sleep that night because I was trying to determine the relationships between multiple agencies. <laughs> this is the chart <laughs> that I provided to the Secretary of Defense. Does anyone suggest that that is a chart that can yield effective, efficient, timely decisions on just about any issue? Of course, the answer is no. But you will also note on this chart, there is not a box for the Special Inspector General for Iraqi Reconstruction. When the Secretary asked me why not, I said, oh, he's over here. He oversees all of this. <laughs> but seriously, that was the context administratively, from a management standpoint, that Stewart and his team had to deal with. David Ignatius, Washington Post columnist, uh, frequent visitor and uh, participant in various CSIS events, uh, wrote an interesting column recently, and it's entitled, In a Crisis, Who Should Take Charge? I'll just excerpt a few sentences from the beginning of it. Imagine that you're sitting in the Situation Room. The National Security Council 
is assembled. President, Vice President, Sec State, Sec Def, uh, advisor to the President for National Security Affairs, and some other hangers on. And you're debating the deteriorating political and security and economic situation in a North African country. Take your pick. The President asks how the United States can prevent conflict there in, those, in, those, in that country without sending in the military. Various cabinet members and agency directors look awkwardly at each other because nobody has a good answer. That description, quite frankly, is exactly what happened 10 years ago. And to this day, our government does not have a good answer as to how we shall deal with interagency issues in a situation where the United States is either drawn in by design or by desire uh, to help in stabilizing a failing or a failed state. Any one of you in this room can pick one or two or three or four countries where that might happen. Notwithstanding that a number of people, both members of Congress, members of the media, members of the academic community, members within the executive branch itself have said, we'll never do an Iraq again. We'll never do an Afghanistan again. And I would hope that we wouldn't. But will we do something similar? Will we, will we be drawn into something, some situation where we are doing arguably armed nation building, or at least we're doing something in conjunction with our allies and friends to stabilize Assyria or an imploding North Korea? Think about that. The work that Stewart has done and his team and the reports that they've written point out the inadequacies and the idiosyncrasies of what it takes to do stabilization and reconstruction operations, what it takes to do an audit under fire. And I congratulate him. I want him to know that the country owes him a debt. Um, the fact that I helped set up his organization both under the CPA and then subsequently as an independent body reporting jointly to the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, I take some pride in, but I do want to say that we have yet, to my, in my opinion, to have learned our lesson, and let's hope that learning from behind may help us out. Stuart. Thank you, Ray, for those kind introductory words, and thank to all of you for being here this afternoon as we talk about uh, my Sigur's final report on, on Iraq reconstruction. Thank you, Judge, for being here today. And, and I want to thank CSIS, Bob, thank you, uh, Tony Quartersman, John Hamry, friends I've made over the last 10 years. Uh, among the blessings of this, this tough uh, mission have been uh, being able to work with people like Ray and Tony and John and Bob and Rick Barton, uh, who, who helped uh, write Hard Lessons, the predecessor volume to, to learning from Iraq. And Chris Kirchhoff, uh, one of the lead writers for that report, is here today. So Chris, thanks for being here. Um, I, want, I want to start by uh, telling you what I'm going to talk about and then uh, put it in context and then get into the meat of the discussion. I'm first going to give you a brief overview of what I learned from the Iraqi leadership uh, during my visit last week, my 34th trip, a record no one else wanted and deservedly so. <laughs> it was, it was, a, it was a still a, a much safer Iraq, but not a safe Iraq that I was in last week. Uh, and then I want to talk about learning from Iraq and go through the seven lessons, but, but I want to begin by saying, putting it in context, please read it. I, I brought copies enough for everyone and, and uh, the, the text speaks for itself. The interviews speak for themselves. They drive the message forward, and, and the message is really a continuing one, one a conversation that you and, and many in this town are engaged in, many here at CIS are engaged in, Tony Cordesman is heavily engaged in, Ray is, and that is what do we do about improving 
our approach to, to tackling stabilization and reconstruction operations. I've got a suggestion here, but it's a, it's a point for discussion. It's, a, it's an argument or an idea, I call it the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations, an idea that really concretizes a larger concept, and that is the need to arrive at integration, not coordination, in how we plan and execute and oversee stabilization and reconstruction operations if we're going to see victory. What's it about? It's about uh, what does victory look like at the end of these very modern, very difficult operations. So let's talk about Iraq now, what I learned last week. I met with Prime Minister Maliki and Deputy Prime Minister Sharistani, the Speaker uh, of the Iraqi Parliament, Osama al Nujafi, very interesting and uh, strong man. He's a Sunni. Uh, um, Maliki and Sharistani, as you know, are Shia, and, and I met with uh, Dr. Abdul Basit, my friend who I've met with every trip for eight years now, who's the head of the Board of Supreme Audit, their, G their Government Accountability Office, but also has the very difficult job of leading the Central Bank of Iraq right now. Potential conflict of interest, I think, on its face, but, uh, but enormous challenges evidenced in my discussions with, with each of them. Prime Minister Maliki is focused on the same thing he's always been focused on whenever I've met with him, and that is what happened to our money. When he says our money, he means the Development Fund for Iraq. That's the roughly $17 billion that the United States had control of, disposed of, during the first year of the Coalition Provisional Authorities uh, uh, Regency in Iraq, and the three years after that when the U.S. Army managed another $3 billion. And the answer is, provided in our 31st audit, believe it or not, addressing the DFI, issued uh, at the end of January, that concluded that about $11.7 billion was at best poorly accounted for, and $3 billion of it, there, there was simply no documentation, no paperwork to, to show what happened to that money. So his frustration, their perturbation at what they see as the failure to implement effective controls in 2003 and 2004 it's well-founded, but they're not done with that issue. We are, uh, but, but the Iraqis, I would expect, as the nature of the discussion revealed, will be pursuing some kind of, com some kind of claim, which the wisdom of which is hard to decipher, at least with regard to filing against the United States. Deputy Prime Minister Sharistani, uh, someone who had been engaged over the years, and he's, all of these gentlemen have been engaged in Iraq for the last 10 years in leadership, but he in particular had been uh, a player in the reconciliation efforts. And he, he largely bemoaned the collapse of Sunni-Shia relations uh, over the last uh, eight months, since September, since the death sentence was issued uh, for the former vice president, a Sunni uh, al-Hashimi, vice president al-Hashimi, then the assault on a man who I really respect and, and, and became friends with over the last five years, the minister of finance, now former minister of finance, Rafi al-Asawi, who's now holed up in Abu Risha's compound in Ramadi. You know, a, a place that uh, the Iraqi army doesn't have purchase over along with Kurdistan, so, so the fracturing is there. Sharistani mainly, though, talked about uh, Jabir al-Nishr, the, the uh, al-Qaeda uh, effort in Syria and the effects of its spillover into western Iraq and how it was re-energizing, unfortunately, uh, Sunni-Shia uh, conflict in the West, but really across the country. And you see it in the public demonstrations, you see it in the assassinations, 50 assassinations in the last month in Iraq. Osama al nujafi the Speaker of the Iraqi Parliament, uh, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was very pessimistic about Sunni-Shia relations right now. And, and as he said publicly in the press, he said to me, uh, uh, there needs to be a change at the top. Uh, he, was, he was quite uh, forceful in his view that, that next year's elections, the parliamentary elections, will probably produce a new Prime Minister for Iraq. But, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Maliki has overcome a lot, so uh, be careful in counting him out. And finally, Dr. Bassett, the head of the GAO and the head of the bank now, told me some important things that, I, you know, that followed up on his discussions with me last September about money laundering. Uh, he then identified that Iraq was losing up to $800 million a week in money laundering, a mind-bogglingly large sum, uh, amounting to $40 billion annually, if that 
can possibly be true. Even if half of it's true, it's, it's completely draining the economy of its means to, to grow. And so those growth figures are, are really uh, written in sand, right? you know, the 14% growth figures as far as having meaningful economic impact upon the country and upon the, the millions who are destitute in Iraq. This time he talked about his role as, as uh, governor of the Central Bank of Iraq, and he said to me that he is now enforcing money laundering regulations, and he said that they had gone unenforced for 10 years. Uh, think about that. Uh, this uh, absolute profligacy uh, uh, in, in, in the theft of, of the lifeblood of, of Iraq's economy, the, the revenues from the oil and gas sector, and uh, at least he is t turning the tide on, on that point. Well, it remains to be seen uh, the effect, because make no mistake, the, the corruption is occurring at the highest level, so you know, we can't be naive about uh, the seriousness with which that will be turned back at this juncture. So that's what I learned in Iraq last week. Tough news. Uh, uh, the provincial elections are coming up soon, April 20th. Uh, and, and I learned from uh, a member of parliament that, that it looks like Iski, the, uh, the, the uh, Islamic uh, uh, Sh Shia party, the leading Shia party in Iraq is going to uh, win a lot of seats back that it lost four years ago. And, and that's one thing that I think the electoral system in, in, in Iraq shows that works is their elections occur reasonably effectively, reasonably peacefully, and they show a, a preference for kicking the bums out. So uh, in this case, Iski lost much last time, will win much this time, and it will portend perhaps somewhat what next year will bring. And that same member of parliament told me that that the that Sadr uh, is not probably going to support Prime Minister Maliki next year, nor will the Kurds, and so that will make a steep climb for him uh, to retain uh, to win a third term. All right, let's move to this last report, learning from Iraq, which I hope most of you have, and and as I said, uh, it 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 is it's shaped around the idea that you know are, really the rhetorical question: uh, Are we well structured? to carry out stabilization and reconstruction operations. And I think all of our work, uh, many of my, some of my SIGR staff are here who helped carry it out, you know, and I want to thank all those who aren't, the auditors, the inspectors, the investigators, who, are, who did the substantive, tough uh, execution of oversight under fire. You know, I had, I had a number of people who served for five years or longer in Iraq, really un, uh, unmatched by any other agency, and they, but that had to be done to get to to this point where, where we can take that collective effort, those findings, those investigations, and turn them into something meaningful, which are lessons learned that can improve our approach. Um, the, as Ray pointed out, the, uh, what's new, what's really new in this report are the 44 interviews I conducted uh, since last September with the Iraqi leadership, Prime Minister Maliki, Deputy Prime Minister Sharistani, and, and, and um, uh, some present and past, each uh, also Prime Minister Alawi, Prime Minister Al Jafri, the, the two former prime ministers in Iraq, uh, and, and other uh, uh, former uh, and present members of, of the Iraqi parliament, but also with, uh, the, with Secretary Panetta, Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns, and Tom Knight, and, and Rajiv Shah, the administrator at USAID, and all of the ambassadors and all of the generals since 2008. You know, hard lessons court sort of took us up to 2008. This helps close the loop. But I, I asked them, as well as the Hill, that, that was the other big difference. I talked to Senator McCain, McCaskill, Collins, a number of House members, uh, asking all of those 44 individuals, what were the effects, in your view, of the Iraq Reconstruction Program? And what lessons, what are the important lessons to draw from this, this tough experience? And the answers tease out the themes uh, and, and undergird and inform the seven lessons. And, and, and interestingly, as, as, as Bob pointed out, you know, it, it's, to a certain extent, they were very foreseeable. Uh, the, the section he wrote from CSIS's report sounds a lot like what's, what's in here. And so, so I, the difference being we now have 10 years of evidence that absolutely substantiates uh, the, those uh, prospective points identified back then. And indeed points that when I first met John Hamry uh, uh, nine years ago, 
great man, wise man, a generous man, a kind man, and a great leader, a public servant. And so, yes, I was so fortunate to have him. And um, I was fortunate to meet him early on and to benefit from his insight and advice. But he was, he was the first assessor over in Iraq. He told me about his first trip. He got in there and with his team and looked around, and this is what he found. Uh, and, and so it was, the, the, uh, the signposts were clear uh, early on in that first year. But, but as I've said uh, before, and, uh, and I say in this report, and I think those of you who've participated, a lot of you have been involved with the Iraq Rebuilding Program know, rather than nine, a nine-year rebuilding program, we had nine one-year rebuilding programs, uh, driven by funding, driven by supplementals, driven by spend rates, driven by interdepartmental competition. And that's what comes out in these interviews uh, on, from the U.S. senior leaders. F on the Iraqi side, what comes out is this repeated complaint that you didn't do enough, that you didn't address corruption sufficiently early on, with no note of irony in those comments, uh, that you didn't, that you didn't um, consult with us. And that's a fair point. And because it's echoed in the senior leader comments, it's echoed across the board among the Iraqi leaders. And, and I think it, it is, it's one of my seven lessons. You've got to consult with the host country before you pick big projects. You know, you've got to, you, you, you can't do it all and do it our own way, as Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns told me, which is what we tried to do. You know, as, as Ambassador Jeffrey said, we, we, we failed to consult effectively with them, Ambassador Crocker recognized the same point in my interview with him, uh, as did uh, General Austin. This, the, the civilians, the, the military leaders, Concord, and the Iraqis, and the Hill, for that matter, uh, recognized uh, this as a crucial element. Of course, you, you might be wondering, why is that a lesson? You know, it doesn't, aren't you supposed to consult? Well, it's a lesson because that's what happened. And, and it was, whatever the factors that drove uh, the failure to consult effectively. And Ambassador Bremer told me we did consult. Well, the Iraqis said not enough. And many others have echoed the same point. Uh, and, and the, and the, and the uh, second point dri drawn out from the interviews, especially with the Hill and with the U.S. leaders, is the failure to have a plan, and the Iraqis too, uh, uh, a plan that was, that was concrete and really a plan B. You know, uh, Winston Churchill said, those who plan do better than those who don't, even if they rarely stick with that plan. And, and Ben Franklin said, failure to plan is planning to fail. You know, I think apt insights from, uh, from uh, great leaders of the past, applicable to what happened. And, and Kubat Talabani, the son of Jalal, who's now a minister in the KRG, said to me, you, you came in with a plan A, but no plan B. And plan A was liberate and leave. Plan B was and became occupy and rebuild. But did we have a system, a structure, a process, an institutional capacity to carry out that plan? And the answer is no. And, and why did we shift so quickly in April? That's a fair question. You know, on March 10th, 2003, as we report in detail in hard lessons, the president, President Bush, made a decision on liberate and leave. With troops were going to be out by September. We were going to spend $2.4 billion. Uh, the Organization for the Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance of Iraq, ORHA, led by retired General Jay Garner, uh, was going to get its job done quickly. We were going to have elections in June or July. There was going to be an interim government in place. And all of that changed in April. And part of the reason certainly was the collapse of governance capacity, the destruction of the ministries, the failure uh, of, of, of uh, the United States to keep order, looting unfolding across uh, Baghdad and beyond. But also Saddam Hussein was loose. I think that, that uh, you know, I don't think you leave it with, with him still on loose. And wasn't caught until the end of that year. Whatever, there wasn't a capacity, a structure, a capability, a system in place to carry out a reconstruction program that quickly went from two to 20 billion in six months, and now 60 billion. <clears throat> and so, uh, looking forward, as I, before I get to the seventh, seventh lessons, you know, uh, I, I wanna, want to give you a, a couple of watchwords, shibboleths to think about uh, as, as you, as you uh, grapple 
with, with what, what we say in this report and as you think about how we should improve. You know, on, uh, we, we need to change, but it needs to be change that improves. Not all change improves. This is what has to happen with regard to how we plan, execute, and oversee stabilization and reconstruction operations. Here are the words. Coordination, integration. In Iraq, we did a lot of coordination. Coordination is an agreement. And that agreement lasts as long as the personalities involved are in sync, that, have, that, are, that are committed to that agreement. Integration is about preparing before you get there, and, ex, and thus having the capacity, and the personnel, and the contracting, and the systems, and the databases, and the oversight that's, that's prepared, that's integrated civ mill, civilian and military, not just within the stovepipes. Rice bowls and stovepipes, you know, those are the metaphors of the moment uh, in, with regard to this issue and, and really all issues almost here in, in Washington. Uh, but they especially are acute when applied to national security matters and stabilization and reconstruction operations. And so some stovepipes have to be knocked down and rice bowls touched for us as a country to respond to this national security crisis, I would say the need to reform our approach to stabilization and reconstruction operations by achieving integration, whatever it is, whatever that outcome might be. Uh, that's, that's the contextual concept uh, with, under which it should fall. So seven lessons, final lessons from Iraq's reconstruction. Uh, this was our ninth lesson learned report and, and really our last report of substance. We'll be doing a couple more reports just to put it in context. The Congress has extended us through September 30th. We got 65 cases ongoing. We're going to get 20 more convictions to add to our 82, recover another 100 million estimated to add to our 200 million, and uh, that to go with 390 audits and about 1.6 billion saved will be SIGGER's uh, accomplishment at the end of the day, the end of September. But more important than those particulars, is, is how they figure into substantiating and leading to meaningful application of what they reveal about, about the Iraq rebuilding program. And number one is let's reform our approach to stabilization and reconstruction operations, what I've been saying, so that we improve our likelihood of a successful outcome, a victory, you know, of achieving our goals in, in these operations. And, and while I think it's you know, self-evident existentially, if not yeah, very straightforward fashion that we're not going to do an Iraq and Afghanistan again. We're going to do significant stabilization operations in in the future, and we we've, we've been in one almost every year since 1982. So, the Balkans was not small, uh, but we also had Somalia and Haiti twice, and Panama and Grenada, uh, and others, and that 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 taxed our uh, our national security. Uh, infrastructure in, in, in unique ways, and, and we might see Syria, we, and, and, and there are certainly others uh, in the offing that, that will certainly draw us into a need to, to apply a civ mill capacity that's not yet perfected. And so I would, I would say as you think about this, what, what, can, what does the United States need to do? How can I contribute to in, in, in strengthening state aid, defense, justice, treasury's approach to integrative planning? Because those are the big five that play a role in these, and 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 to date they're not really integrated. There have been important reforms. We point out, I point them out in Chapter Six, and Rick Barton is leading one at the at CSO, the Conflict and Stabilization Operations Bureau at State. But that's that's a creation. Let me just put it in context. Since ni 1990, there have been a number of offices created with within agencies to respond to stabilization operations. Office of Transition Initiatives at Aid. Uh, CSO at State, the Civilian Expeditionary Workforce at Defense, ISITAP at Justice, the Office of Technical Assistance at Treasury. Each agency has responded, and, and, and uh, each in an, within its particular confines in an effective way, but not in an integrated way. And that, I think, to succeed, if, we're all gonna work, if they're all going to work together on the ground, they ought to prepare in an integrated fashion in advance. Ryan Crocker likes this idea when I, when I briefed, when I interviewed him, as does General Scowcroft, uh, you know, one of the CIS uh, uh, founders and CSIS, and uh, Stephen Beecroft, uh, who I spent a couple hours visiting with in, in Iraq last week, said, yeah, I mean, he, he said, this is the way we should go. And so, so uh, and, and a number of others 
but, but ultimately, it's about the community, about the community of influence uh, on the Hill, um, uh, within the agencies, um, in the think tanks that will shape this discussion. This is just a contribution to it to advance it. Second, ensure sufficient security and start small. And really, I, I would say the metric here is to, you know, the, the, the graver the security problem, the smaller the project should be. And if it's, a, if it's an absolutely insecure situation, then you shouldn't be doing rebuilding. Uh, and, and we got that, there was no such metric, no such measure, no such applicable approach in Iraq. For instance, we went forward with what became the $108 million Fallujah wastewater treatment plan in 2004 in the middle of, of armed open conflict with the Sunnis in that very restive city back then. And it continued to be a struggle out in Western Iraq for seven years. Uh, that it took to complete that project, three times longer than it should have cost, three times as much. That's what happens. As, as Ambassador Crocker said to me, if you, know, if, you, if you go in and you try to carry out these, these pro projects in unstable settings, estimate that they're going to cost ten times what you, what you started with. Uh, Tom Knight said, bigger is not better. You know, plan, plan, you must plan for security challenges, uh, as Jim Marshall said to me, a congressman who made numerous visits to Iraq and now is leading uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace. Excellent interview in the, in the, in the report uh, on that subject. Third key lesson, consult. Well, I've talked about it already. Again, why is it a lesson? Fair question. It is. We didn't consult enough, and, and ultimately it's about I'd say educated, intelligent consultation. In other words, going in, recognizing what the capacity of the host country is, what, the, what their governance, their literacy rate is, their, their governance strength, uh, their infrastructure outputs, and then beginning to develop with them in the lead uh, a sense of the kind of rebuilding program that, that they can do, that they can sustain. As our, as our audit showed, Perhaps the largest waste, and we estimate in this report at least eight billion of our 60 was probably wasted in Iraq. A lot of that, but, but that's a conservative figure because, because the Iraqis don't have a culture of operate and maintain. You know, they use it till it breaks. And, and, and so that, that's where you have to start, and you have to start breaking them of use it till it breaks, as I, as I say somewhere in here. And, and that's uh, was difficult to do. Sustainment was the watchword. Did they, were they willing to sustain what we built for them? No. I'm, our inspectors visited the most expensive project. Number one, the Nazaria water treatment system. Treat, served five villages in the south. Uh, it was already done, turned over to them. Operating at 20%. Why? They didn't know how to work it. Why? Because the tribe that was there demanded to hold all the jobs and that tribe happened to be illiterate. And, and uh, you know, over 300 million spent on that. And, and a very, very uh, frustrating thing. It's gotten better, but certainly not the outcome anyone wanted. Careful planning, careful engagement. You know, last point about that, when they turned it on, it was a system that was too powerful for the pipes serving the pipes. So suddenly it was, it was like 4th of July in New York City, water exploding everywhere in the streets as the pipe burst. And, uh, and in the middle of the summer. And, you know, these are really unfortunate uh, uh, outcomes that better consultation, better planning might have obviated. Fourth lesson, develop uniform systems. This, this is our last audit, uh, really nails this one, released um, a few weeks ago. And, and it, it's just the fact we don't know because we didn't have systems in place about 30, 25, 30 percent what we built because it just wasn't tracked. There was no uniform system that everyone used. The Iraq Reconstruction Management System was something people were supposed to use, created after our audits identified that there was no system, but there was no requirement. And as a result, some got in, some didn't, and we know about three quarters of what we built. That doesn't make sense. That can be fixed, but, but also it's not just databases. It's contracting. Every agency did its own uh, Contracting, it has its own federal acquisition regulation uh, approach. And as, as General Bostic, the commander of the Corps of Engineers today, who was actually the first commander of the Gulf Region Division 10 years ago in Iraq, 
uh, echoing uh, a recommendation we made in our contracting lesson report, we ought to create a contingency federal acquisition regulation that's tuned to the necessities of this kind of, of conflict s setting. And so that it's easier to use. So, you don't, so you're not in Fallujah under fire, you know, tapping on your commuter with Fed biz ops trying to get a bid in. You know, that's, that's nuts. And, uh, but it's what happens. And then you've got to figure out which agents am I working, aid, defense, and what happens when the money's mixed? You know, th these, are, these are challenges, these are burdens on the contracting community that they want to see the government fix. And, and uh, they're not fixed yet. Number five, ensure robust oversight. I, th I think that's, that's sort of the SIGR story. I mean, it, it, the first year was, was not overseen. And, and there, you know, one of our cases, the Bloomstein uh, conspiracy that we broke in Hilla, Babylon, uh, involving uh, Robert Stein, the controller for the CPA, and Philip Bloom, both of whom, by the way, had prior felony convictions for fraud. Uh, and, and they were engaged in what, what, what they said, they described it as a, as a, as a free fraud zone. And, and Stein, when we interviewed him in prison a few years ago, you know, said, hey, if there'd been some oversight on the ground, you know, when this was going on, you know, I'm, you know, I might have thought twice of this. You know, I might not have engaged in this crime. Well, maybe not. He's a crook, but, but nevertheless, uh, deterrence is deterrence, and and that's I think that's the highest and best use of a robust oversight presence. And is not you, you need to catch what you can catch. Catch you know catching crooks is tough in a war zone. Uh, I had unfortunately I had uh, you know an informant you know murdered a few days before he was supposed to come see us and. Uh, and that's, that was people were watching our door, and it was very dangerous in Iraq for a long time uh, in that regard. And so I understand why people didn't come forward. Uh, but uh, being present made a difference. And, and being present in a robust fashion uh, is crucial. We, we got up to 55 personnel in 2008 at, at our peak, and, uh, and, and that, that helped deter, I think, uh, uh, wrongdoing and promote good conduct. So, you know, Senator Collins, Senator McCain recognized this. Senator McCollins, I think, really of, uh, a strong advocate uh, of strong, of, of effective and robust oversight early on, helped make our office happen. As Senator McCain, in my interview with him, said, hey, Congress was out the window, quote unquote, you know, on this issue early on. And, and it's something we have to learn and not let happen again. Number six, preserve what worked. You know, I, you'll, you'll see in here, you know, this is not just a litany of failure. There were a lot of projects that did make a difference. And, and as in my interview with General Petraeus revealed, there was the, the spending on the security sector, about $25 billion, you know, gave Iraq its best equipped, best trained army and police ever. Perhaps a mixed blessing at this current juncture because of potential abuse, particularly of the Special Operations Forces. But it is perhaps the best special operations force in the Middle East today. And that's directly because of the, the U.S. training, the U.S. funding. And that funding continues. The largest engagement at this moment uh, in Iraq, as far as, as far as aid goes, is the f foreign military sales program. 19 billion already in cases. And, and you know, 38 F-16s are going to be the first ones delivered in, in, uh, in September of this upcoming year. And, you know, 131 M1, A1 Abrams tanks. And this is, this is, this is a, a lot of hardware, a lot of capacity that's, that's going to provide Iraq with, a, with a substantially enhanced security. But it worked in, with, in regards to the issues that General Petraeus and others faced in 2007. And that was a civil war, a collapse in the country, you know, an absolute continuous spate of bloodletting. That was that was extraordinarily difficult. I, when I went to the battle update assessment briefings in in the spring of 2007, it was it was a very depressing briefing because of the level of loss that we were enduring in that spring. It got 90 percent better by December of that year. Uh, but what else worked? Uh, Commander's Emergency Response Program money. This was a unique uh, revolution in rebuilding uh, programs in the history of the United States, giving battalion brigade commanders, you know, substantial sums, 4.1 billion in Iraq to, to carry out large projects. And when they worked, they were 
they weren't large. Uh, you know, they, the, the key was, was, was keeping a lid on the, on the funding, and, and unfortunately that, that got out of control in 2008, and, and our reporting revealed that, and eventually the Congress acted, put a lid on it, and it and, but Congress shouldn't be the program office. So managed correctly, SERP can work and can be an important tool in, in the commander's uh, arsenal or weapon, as, it, as, as their own training document calls it, money is a weapon system. The other, the other element uh, I think evolved in Iraq was the provincial reconstruction, reconstruction team program, and that, that really is was sort of a laboratory for what I'm talking about in lesson one, creating an integrative civ mill capacity that can carry out uh, a capacity building and rebuilding efforts uh, in, a, in a stabilization operation. And, and the PRTs, when they worked, they were dependent upon good leadership. That was the defining element that I learned from my interviews. Leadership, <clears throat> uh, they made a difference across Iraq. Uh, and, and they should be preserved in the future with more training. The key, was, as, as uh, Jim Marshall told me, is that there was no system, no PRT university, no, capa no place where they really could strengthen those who served in the PRTs uh, so that they could achieve more. And finally, uh, lesson seven, you know, kind of a perfunctory one, but again, uh, crucial. And that is plan, 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 plan comprehensively, plan for plan B, uh, plan in an integrated fashion. That means including everybody, and, and it's difficult to do in an interagency fashion today. Those of you working within agencies know that you have liaisons, but, it, but, but there's not really a context or a, a system in place for, for effective, regular, ongoing, integrated planning, and, and, and that's what that's what uh, I su suggest when, when I suggest the U.S. Office for Contingency Operations uh, sort of a straw man argument to think about how, what that would look like. It's spelled out in, in, uh, in, in Chapter 6 here, and, and the appendix gives a sort of proposed bill, what it, how that might come into being. Whatever it's, whatever, whatever's going to come out at the end is going to be different from that. But, but, it, but it needs to be, as I said uh, at the beginning, uh, a reform that improves, a change that makes a difference, and one that, that, that obtains buy-in. And I think ultimately it's going to come from the Congress, and it needs, to, it needs to be a reform that takes account of the reality of the era we live in, that our national security interests are at stake more in this setting, stabilization and reconstruction operations, than perhaps any other uh, in the 21st century. And that's, that's a... That's a uh, I think uh, a premise that, that has to be embraced. And the second premise is that they are civ mill operations. You know, the, 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 as I've described it in other contexts, the DOD is the backbone and the, the brain is, is the civilian side. The, the civilians must be in the lead, as, as Congressman Welch said. You know, you, DOD, and, and General Austin said it to me too, you know, DOD is not, should not have the lead in this, but it's a crucial player. And, and in, in, uh, in ensuring that you are structuring well to plan, to execute, to oversee these kinds of operations, then you strengthen the possibility of victory at the end of the day. And, and let me just close with a quote from uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel, who, you know, perfectly positioned in his new uh, office uh, to, and, and a supporter of SIGARA, and I met with him many times uh, over the last uh, nine years, uh, to, to, to lead this new thinking as they approach it. He said, foreign policy will require a strategic agility that, whenever possible, gets ahead of the problems, strengthens U.S. security and alliances, and promotes American interest and credibility. You know, wise words from, from a wise man and a good leader, and, and uh, you know, I think that, that along with Senator Kerry, who's, who, who gets all of this as well, uh, we can look forward to improvements but among the agencies, those sec uh, state and defense being the most important, that will strengthen uh, the likelihood of victory. So I want to thank CSIS, Bob, uh, Tony, and Ray. And John Hamry especially uh, for having me, and, and uh, I think Tony, you're you're up for for a response. Thank, and thank you all for being here. Thank
It is a pleasure to follow on Bob and Stuart and Ray. It uh, at the same time strikes me as having come back from Afghanistan that these lessons are anything but theoretical. The fact is that we're not leaving Afghanistan in 2014. We are simply reducing our presence and attempting to make Afghanistan work. And the time limit we have set is now 2018 to 2021. And we are going to have to apply these lessons in a country which cannot use its oil revenues to buy its way out of many of the problems that Iraq could buy its way out of. One way or another, whether it is the World Bank or any other outside voice, Afghanistan will not and cannot succeed without sustained dependence on aid. But I'd like to also just make a broader point here. Stuart focused on his mission, which is the reconstruction of Iraq. But the fact is that aid is only part of what we do in civil military impacts. We have a vast amount of military spending in country, which comes from forces moving equipment, buying services, from the construction of facilities by the State Department. When you think of the aid money, $60 billion is nothing to dismiss. But if I can paraphrase Everett Dirksen, a trillion here and a trillion there sooner or later adds up to real money. $1.7 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan and counting. We have no way of knowing as a country how much of that money actually got to either Iraq or Afghanistan. We have no system within USAID, the State Department or the Defense Department that can even roughly estimate what amount of money reaches and stays in country. It is probably a much smaller fraction than that 1.7 trillion. But that raises the issue of what happens if we really want to understand what we are spending in general, where we are spending it, and why we are spending it. The argument in the past has been that you spend out of the necessity of war. But these are limited wars fought for limited objectives. Simply throwing money into the problem for U.S. forces merely makes no more sense than throwing money into the problem for aid. Being able to account only by line item and service in the OCO account provides no basis, not only for the kind of planning that Stewart talked about, but quite frankly, trying to figure out why we assign given amounts of money to given force elements, to given activities, and what their effectiveness is. And this is an issue which becomes further compounded because of these strange objects known as allies. In Iraq, we had at least some simplicity because most of the allies left early. In Afghanistan, we have 50-odd countries. Two-thirds of the country is PRTs that are not American. The primary responsibility for aid was not the United States. The organization we tried to set up to coordinate this, UNAMA gave up in the third year of its existence. It simply could not get cooperation from member countries to support even a crude estimate of total aid spending. And no one could figure out the correlation between aid spending in country and military spending in country. I have not usually met people as pessimistic as the last three heads of UNAMA but they have been remarkably frank and remarkably consistent in warning. I'm also struck by the fact that 
in calling for better planning and coordination. We are 10 years on in two wars. USAID has never issued a credible estimate of the impact of any given aid activity. We have measures based on health care, which is an hour and a half walk from a facility. If the standard in the United States was being within an hour and a half's drive of a medical facility and that was all we needed for medical care, we could eliminate Medicare, Medicaid, and most of our entitlements programs immediately. We have figures on education and percentages of men and women. But if you look at the numbers, the estimate on population uncertainty is between 25 and 35 million. Exactly where aid gets any numbers is a little striking. You have claims of improvement in GDP, but as the World Bank points out, virtually all of the growth in the Afghan GDP came from agriculture and was determined largely by rainfall and had nothing to do with aid. In fact, in the most recent study issued about a month ago, if you contrast what we say to the extent we have measures of effectiveness, aid pointed out that basically speaking, a country which is supposed to be benefiting from aid was a country where something like 6 to 10 percent of the population saw the impact of aid, where 56 percent of the population is estimated to be unemployed or underemployed, and where the net gain in per capita income during the only two years for which we have data, which in no way has impeded U.S. government estimates, data seems to be unnecessary, was an increase in per capita income of $2.20 a month in temporary jobs. We cannot go on spending money where the main metric is, Stewart's report points out, how quickly you can spend it regardless of your absorption capacity, corruption, and the need for the money. At the same time, we have other measures of effectiveness. What is aid? What is SERP? What is military spending doing to provide military effectiveness? The measures we used in Iraq were significant acts. It's interesting to note that if you look at the data coming out of ISAF between 2009 and today, the surge had absolutely no impact on the pattern of SIGAX whatsoever. And the measure that they attempted to use, which was enemy-initiated attacks, which initially proved to be a public relations gesture, became a major embarrassment when recalculating it, they discovered we had a decline in capability between 2011 and 2012, with the end result that they had to take all of the data off the ISAF website. That is a somewhat memorable warning about the need not only for the integrated planning that has been called for, but frankly having planners that have meaningful metrics, who know something about plans, who can actually go beyond project planning and do economic planning for a country that can focus on campaign effectiveness in ways where there is some consistent measure. And here, let me just point out something that we can see in both the Afghan and Iraq com conflicts. In both cases, we bypassed virtually all of the bureaucratic structure and interagency forum. In Afghanistan, we did it because we didn't have time. You can argue it was an act of necessity. In Iraq, we did it because of struggles between state, the Defense Department, the Vice President's office, and the end result basically was 
We planned on the basis of ideology, and as Stuart pointed out, that collapsed within a month of the fall of Baghdad. We had no plan in either case, in any realistic sense, to deal with what we were going to do in those countries to move forward. General Garner was precluded from having planning, and in the case of Afghanistan, we set plans called the Afghan Compact, which called for a millennial change to be achieved through osmosis, a form of planning I would not necessarily encourage for the future. In both cases, we threw far more money into the countries than they could absorb, and strangely enough, we then accused them of being corrupt. Let me say that if the supply of money vastly exceeds the ability to spend it wisely, it will in general be spent, particularly if you are pushing the speed of spending as a key metric of success. Who's to blame? It probably was not the Iraqis and the Afghans. We imposed indirectly two failed constitutions in the name of democracy without creating meaningful local or provincial elections and without giving the bodies that we were creating the ability to control and manage money. In both cases, it has been a disaster. In Iraq, less than Afghanistan, where the president controls not only virtually the entire flow of on-budget money, but virtually all appointments. We had two wars in which we took several years to admit we were at war and dealing with serious conflicts. Some of you may vaguely remember the period in Iraq when we were not going to use the term insurgency or civil war within the Department of Defense. In Afghanistan, basically, we did not react in spite of the warnings of ambassadors and commanders-in-chief in the area because Iraq consumed too many resources. What that cost in wounded in blood is another reason to look at integrated civil military planning. In both wars, we had a military surge without a civil surge. In Afghanistan in particular, by the time the civil group arrived, it was time to leave, which they are now doing as we are closing PRTs all over the country. We had two failed elections in Iraq, which created much of the political turmoil that exists there. And we have a massive question in the spring of 2014 as to whether we will have a meaningful election in Afghanistan, and more importantly, a meaningful leader and meaningful governance. And as Ray touched upon, when we look at this, it isn't just Afghanistan. It is the question of what happens when we have to deal with Syria or Libya, which is an ongoing issue, or Yemen. It's a question if we don't want to have more Iraqs in Afghanistan, and we rely on sea air campaigns to deal with Iran and North Korea, what next? Because at some point the military activities will stop and the questions raised in Iraq and Afghanistan in some form will have to be dealt with. The Arab decade is replacing the Arab Spring. We have no idea where we will intervene or have to deal with this. We have problems in Central Asia, South Africa, and obviously in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I do not believe these are casual lessons. I do not believe they are lessons of the past, and above all, I do not believe they are lessons that we can use constructively by looking backwards and focusing on the problem after it already exists. We face institutional challenges 
on the basis of a system in the United States national security community which clearly has not worked over a decade in two different wars. And if we do not learn from that, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Ray, and um, thank you, Stuart, um, for uh, for both your your service over the past ten years um, for this fine report. We have seen um, you know, from this particular effort uh, a new set of efforts, uh, lessons to be learned. Uh, sometimes are referred to as lessons collected. Um, I made reference earlier to the lessons we collected ten years ago um, from uh, in the program that I currently run. Uh, that were based on lessons from the 1990s. Um, and in fact, in 1958, the Atlantic did a lessons learned uh, effort on Iraq uh, and published Lessons from Iraq um, in 1958. In 1949, the World Bank published its third annual report to its board of trustees. Um, and it said that in their first year, their first three years, they've learned a few important lessons about international efforts to uh, stabilize and reconstruct and develop um, foreign nations. One is that, that development and stabilization happens as the result of the efforts of the people in those countries themselves, and we in the international community can only be supportive of them. And two, when we support them, we should make sure that we're coordinating with each other and planning and so on and so forth. So uh, we now have a, a solid 60 odd years of lessons learned and learned and relearned. And one of the things that our program has been doing in the past year has been looking at the issue of why aren't we learning these lessons uh, in the context of trying to understand a little bit better the absorptive capacity problem. We've uh, interviewed some people at the World Bank and at the State Department and USAID and other development agencies to try to understand this. And there's just two preliminary findings that we have from the first phase of this effort that we just wrapped up that, um, that I think are relevant here. Um, and the first is that what everybody reported was that the top line number that they had to work with uh, in terms of how much money that they had to spend in these efforts had nothing to do with, with the needs on the ground or what they wanted to do. These were political decisions made either by you know, uh, World Bank boards or um, members of Congress and Parliament or, or politicians. And so the development organizations themselves and others had to just work with whatever number they happened to be given, um, whether that had anything to do with the capacity to absorb it or not. Um, and the second was that the people who, who do collect these lessons and learn this knowledge and, um, and know the countries themselves, they're not the ones who have authority over the contracting processes. They're not the ones who have authority over uh, human resources management and how, how decisions are made about who gets promoted and why they get promoted. They're not the ones who have authority over people who determine um, personnel security policies and how you can operate out in the field, um, whether independently or not. Um, yet all of those offices do have authority over those who are trying to plan and implement. And there seems to be a fundamental disconnect between our internal uh, organizational processes and knowledge flows and cultures and uh, internal incentives and the things that we're actually trying to achieve. And so in the phase two of the work that we're doing on absorptive capacity, we're looking at that particular issue. Um, I would like to open uh, the session now uh, to questions from all of you. I would like to request that, uh, first of all, when I call on you, you wait until the microphone gets to you. The microphone will be on, so please don't push any buttons. Um, identify yourself and your affiliation, if you would, and please try to keep your, com your uh, question as a question and not as a long comment so that we can uh, get as many uh, qu um, questions in as possible. So uh, let's start on this side of the room, um, gentlemen in the second row. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Jajic, currently working with the Syrian Emergency Task Force on planning for uh, setting up governance structures in the liberated areas. So your comments are obviously highly relevant for whether we're going to succeed at that or not. I wanted, my question is basically directed to the point that uh, Bob Lamb has made. We've learned these, le we haven't learned these lessons. We've seen these lessons identified previously, 10 years ago, but we keep reinventing the flat tires. So I'd like to ask you, how would you fix this with USOCO? What authorities are needed and, and processes would you want, if you had a magic wand, how would you fix this problem? 
Well, we spelled out in chapter six, but let me let me start with an important initial lesson, a, a, a prerequisite to, to the implementation, and that is it can't be fixed through presidential decisions. PDD 56 uh, was passed in the mid-1990s. Len Hawley helped implement that, and it was an integrated uh, approach that, that, that had some capacity to work that, that, that forced at least conceptually and somewhat on the ground, the agencies to work together in the Balkans and, and to some good effect. The, uh, the reality is, is that it went away with NSPD-1 in 2001, uh, which just underscores the fact that, that if the succeeding administration doesn't want to continue the previous administration's national security directives, it does away with them. And, and that happened again uh, a few years ago. And so, so uh, if, for example, we, uh, President Bush tried to fix it through National Security Presidential Directive 44, which created the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. But it didn't have any lift. You know, it was completely dependent upon uh, the attention of the Secretary of State. And if that attention wasn't there, then there was no lift. And, and ultimately, SCRS got absorbed into CSO. Uh, the point I'm making is uh, it's, it's, it's got to happen on the Hill. And so it has to happen through legislation, meaningful change to our authorized structure of government uh, comes from the committees on the Hill. And, and that's where the battles are fought as well. I mean, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, House Foreign Affairs uh, uh, Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee, the, these are the places where this issue has to be addressed. And, and, and whatever the solution is, you soak or whatever, finding a civ mill integration, integrated structure that, that the, the agencies then can agree upon and move forward, uh, I think has to happen up on Capitol Hill because it just isn't going to happen through presidential directives and it's just not happening through osmosis, you know, of the, of the agencies. And, and so, uh, the, the, the reality is, is that it, it's going to be, a, if, you, if you pardon the illusion, a Goldwater Nichols moment that, that directs a change. And, and look, Goldwater Nichols worked, you know, I mean, regardless of what you think of what came after, 1991 and 2003 were successful air land joint uh, operations that accomplished their mission very quickly uh, and successfully. And so I think for, for this, this is a tougher nut to crack. This is a civ mill nut, and and uh, and it will it will take uh, serious engagement by the expertise and the leaders and leadership on on Capitol Hill that listens to the agencies in developing that that solution and uh, and then finds a path forward. And look, one last point: there has been some progress, as I point out, in Chapter Six, the Global Security Contingency Fund. And this was an idea that came out of Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton's uh, recognition of the problem and trying to fix it this way, through funding. But that's just funding. You know, there's personnel and systems and contracting and, and oversight, and, and you can't just solve or try to solve one piece of it by saying, hey, we're going to do a key on funding for security issues in all these places. And that money hasn't been spent yet because we don't know what comes next. Uh, second question, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my name is Yasmin, and I'm a journalist. Uh, how much of a role do you think that the um, Sunni Shiri Kurd uh, divisiveness will will play in Iraq going forward? Um, and if you could also address what a role what role Syria plays in that? Um, and uh, just yeah, looking past when the when the U.S. is no longer uh, fully involved in Iraq, please. Well, the answer is a huge role, uh, the dominant role and influential role and in how Iraq is able to grapple with this issue because it's their issue uh, will determine how the country makes progress uh, in the next 10 years. I, I'm, as I've said to some, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat pessimistic in the short term but more optimistic in the long term. Uh, that optimism stems from a hope that they are able to address that Sunni Shia. Now, last September when I met with Minister Al-Asadi, Minister of Interior, he said to me a year ago, in other words, in, in 2011, the Sunni Shia issue was not on my radar. Now it's the number one issue on my radar. And it hasn't gotten better since then. Uh, the Kurdish Arab issue is, is forms around Kirkuk. The, the Kurds claim it is their historic capital, but, but more importantly, a, an ocean of oil underlies Kirkuk. And, and the Kurdistan would like to drill it and export it, and, and would be happy to do so independent of Baghdad, and Baghdad won't let that happen. Um, 
uh, member of parliament, Bayan Jobber, who I met with, uh, who was former Minister of Interior and Minister of Finance, suggested an idea that, that I've heard before, but, but perhaps maybe moving forward now, and that is creating a region. There's a special provision in the Constitution of Iraq that allows to create a region, a region out of Kirkuk, which would create an essentially semi-autonomous entity, and that would allow the people of Kirkuk to decide the way forward. I think that's plausible and, uh, and could help resolve the, the Kurdish-Arab tensions. Syria, uh, as, as Deputy Prime Minister Shah Rastani said, it, it's, it's uh, fundamentally and daily impacting uh, Western Iraq. And, and as I said, there, there are parts in Anbar that, over the, which the IA doesn't have purchase now because of uh, uh, growing Sunni power. Doug Brooks, I'm an independent consultant, but formerly head of the International Stability Operations Association, which represented a lot of the contractors working over there. Um, certainly, the, there were a lot of problems with the fraud and abuse, and you talk about what, almost 100 convictions now and, and hundreds of millions return. Um, but the overwhelming problem is what you said in six of your recommendations out of seven, which is really the coordination and, um, uh, and planning aspect. This sort of new entity uh, doesn't seem to have any support at all from state and DOD and USAID. How, how do we ensure that these guys, even if we do create the entity, that all these all, that they will all work together and do that kind of planning to address this problem? Well, I don't know how we ensure it. You know, I think the Congress has to uh, create, has to do oversight. You know, to to advance it and ultimately. As I said, this, what I suggest is a straw man, a, a, a point for discussion uh, from which, uh, you know, further refinement uh, should evolve. And, and uh, I, you know, the, the, it's, it's really, it really falls, it, it just concretizes, I think, something we all agree on, and that is the current system is not effective. The status quo is not acceptable. Okay, if the status quo is not acceptable, that means we have to make some form of progress. What's that progress going to look like? Should it just be pouring money into the agencies? That appears to be the approach now. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to work. Uh, here in the front. Jack Shaw. If you could wait till the microphone comes, please. Thank you, sir. Jack Shaw, I was a former uh, colleague of... of uh, of various of you actually up, up there, and was former Inspector General of Foreign Assistance at State, uh, which brings me back to some of this. But I wanted to bounce off Stuart, something that he and I have talked about over time. He, he, he at one point said, you know, I don't do Iraqi corruption, and, and it's, it's, it, it is a wise thing too, because you would have had no time to do most of anything else uh, if you had been involved with that. But I raised, as you, you may remember, uh, one of the biggest corruption situations in Iraq back in the in the in 04, 03, uh, that involved a, a fellow by the name of Ned Miauchi, and it uh, it basically uh, was was so big and so involved with uh, a key bunch of, of the political players that it, and was in, had involvement from the Pentagon as well that uh, there was there was no way to really attack it, and the end result was that that. There was a whole system of corruption which began to grow on that, the so-called London Group and others that, that became part of the exercise. And the question I have is, is there any way, you must have accumulated vast amounts of stuff uh, that has to do with the Iraqi side of the, the picture, that, that after, after the, the, the dust has settled on this, you could begin to look at the larger picture and the way in which all of our best intentions were amplified in ways that were otherwise predictable within the, the Iraqi culture. You're right, Jack. I have talked to the Iraqis about it. I, I, I don't prosecute or investigate Iraqis, but I bring to their attention uh, potential cases. And, and indeed, in particular, for example, the defense minister back in 2003, 2004, Hazan al-Shalan, his head of contracting, Ziad Qatan, and their co-conspirator, Nair Jamali. Uh, for, you know, engaged in a crime that stole 1.2 billion in cash from the Ministry of Defense in 2004. And now, Hazan al Shalana, uh, actually, uh, Brian Jarber told me he saw him recently, he flew in on his private jet into Baghdad and he said, hey, I didn't take all of it. Uh, you know, and there, and then there were lots of politicians who got some of it here. You know, and I said to Brian, well, tell him to say who. 
But here's the here's the the, the rub in in Iraqi politics is in 2008 they passed something called the amnesty law. The amnesty law just essentially said for non capital crimes, you're free. You know, they just, they, essentially those in power I, were wiping their own slates clean as well as others like uh, Hazan al-Shalan and Ziyad Katan. And so they're going to have to find other means. First of all, they've got to get out of the habit of passing amnesty laws. And second, they need to uh, move forward in finding a way to recover that. Those lost billions. The hundreds of billions of dollars in Iraqi funds have been stolen by leadership over the last 10 years, mostly through money laundering. And, and it's, uh, it's an outrage, uh, and, but it's something that the Iraqis have to resolve if they're going to make progress. You know, for, for my 10-year optimism to be realized, the number one corruption problem today is money laundering. It's huge, it's out of control, and they don't know how to tackle it. And they could start by creating an anti-money laundering task force and begin investigating all these crimes. Well, let's uh, go on the back over there, please. Jerry? Jerry Hyman at CSIS. Uh, I haven't read the whole report, and I haven't even read your whole proposed bill, but I've looked through a couple of parts, and I wonder if you could help us unpack it a bit. In the first part, you say that the office is going to be established and shall report to the, to state, the, Depar the uh, Department of State and the Department of Defense. But then the, in Section 201, the director shall have primary management responsibilities and consult with state and defense. So the second thing is, uh, so, so you have a, isn't there a bit of a, I, I hate to get in the weeds here, but is, is, that a, is that a problem? Secondly, the NSC, at least in my experience, was deeply engaged in a lot of these decisions, going in, what to do, very micromanaged. Does the NSC play a role here? Yes. And if so, uh, how do you, yep. how, does that, how does this all, how does this work out? Good question. Good question. Uh, yeah, I think your first point, I think it is in the weeds. You know, these are these are wording things that will have to be worked out. Uh, the the idea of joint reporting, uh, it's not unique. It's what I do. I report to Sec State and the Sec Defense, and and it and it seems to have worked out well, as as my experience. Uh, with regard to the NSC, yes, there's another portion of the statute uh, proposed bill, I should say, that that includes reporting to. Uh, the National Security Advisor, and I think that's crucial to weave in the policy component. The policy is driven, as you rightly point out, from the NSC. But uh, you, the, the NSC also, in Iraq, tried to run it start in, from 2007 on through something called the IMS, the Interagency Management System. Didn't work. You know, it, it rarely met, and it just, and it, when it did, it just adjudicated uh, various disputes that happened to bubble up at, at that moment, and it, it was not, it had no strategic or, for that matter, tactical influence over the relief and reconstruction operation in Iraq or Afghanistan, because it was covering both. And uh, I think that that's, uh, at least it, among the case studies, another one uh, that didn't work. Follow up. Can I just follow up for a minute? Same person. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> Part of the new mantra is whole of government. And whole of government includes not only state and defense agencies and their subs, but all kinds of other agencies as well. They would have to be woven in here too, yes, right? Yes, that's correct. And, and so there, this, this office would have to have some kind of authority, would it yes. not? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Over all of these departments o in order to work. Only was, when you read the full statute, it does get into that, and it also limits itself. Uh, but I think I probably the whole of government is now the old mantra. You know, I think I think it's it's uh, been ushered out, uh, and we're still looking for the next mantra. And uh, and and I think that um, the reality is is that that yes, you're right. This is the challenge. As I said, there are five major players: state, aid, defense, treasury, and justice. You know, uh, and the first three are the the leads, really, if you will. And, but, but all have to have a role, and, but, but this is, this more looks, the, the, the enabling statute would somewhat parallel the enabling statute for FEMA. In other words, when, when an SRO is declared, it has its life, its authority for a limited period. It has access to the fund, the contingency fund, for a limited period. And I think that's the fear at state and defense that it would be exerting authority over for an extended period and reaching into diplomacy and defense matters that are well beyond its ambit. 
and 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 that's why that whatever whatever it's, if this comes into being, those issues have to be crafted in a way. The statute has to be crafted in a way that that, that resolves those issues. In the center, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Warner Anderson, uh, Department of Defense, International Health. Um, I did two tours in Iraq. Uh, one is a civil affairs medical officer, another is a special forces medical officer, and. Um, I've, first of all, thank you very much. I heard you loud and clearly about security being necessary for reconstruction and, and for development. The World Bank uh, said the same thing in 2011, so that wasn't quite as clear in 2003. Uh, we thought that development would lead to security. Um, the, the, the kind of salient point that I'm taking from a lot of the discussion on the 10th anniversary is that maybe we shouldn't be doing the donor model of reconstruction, because the donor model tends to displace investment. USAID now is moving more toward a, an investment model, I believe, and uh, it seems to me that 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 maybe we we keep trying to relearn the lessons, but I think sometimes that the reason we can't apply them is because we couldn't apply them earlier. The same reasons uh, uh, apply later on. If we could do investment. I don't know how to do that. I'm not a, a capitalist guy. But if we could do investment, it seems like there are a lot of safeguards involved in that that could bypass a lot of the issues that we keep finding ourselves in. You're exactly right, Warren. And and the 60 billion for Iraq, 90 billion for Afghanistan, gifts. I mean, they're you know direct aid, not no no um, leverage per se. And Senator Collins told me in her interview she pressed back in the fall of 2003 to do some of this through loans. And Dana Rohrbacher had previously told me the same thing. He pushed for it as well, and and were, they were quickly, uh, you know, shut up. And but I think that's, you know, to get buy-in, you know, which is what we've done over the last few years when we, we don't have any money left. I mean, Iraq money has dominated since 2008. But to get leverage, to get them to not look look at us as I've called it as as Uncle Sugar, you know, the Uncle Sugar effect. We, they the Iraqis just got used to us showing up with stuff. And when we stop showing up with stuff, they stop taking meetings. You know, and that's what Ambassador Beecroft has to deal with now. He shows up, he doesn't have any stuff, so what's his leverage when he wants to say, stop your overflights, you know, to Iranian overflights? You know, it, he doesn't have a lot of remaining leverage just because we had a nine year program of largesse, and, uh, effectively. And, and so I think that is a key point. It's not spelled out detail in this report at all other than the, through the interviews but loans forcing buy-in by any means possible is is good way to shape behavior and let me just take a partial exception to one thing you said that 10 years ago it wasn't so clear the security needed to be done I'll just go back to July 2003 in which in which my predecessors wrote quote security is the sine qua non of post-conflict reconstruction if security needs are not met it won't work <laughs> um, it, which you know, the, one of the um, uh, one of the themes that keeps coming up is is the issue of um, the the problems with the reconstruction effort, particularly the civilian reconstruction effort. Uh, and when you speak to um, people in the development field at USAID and and in um, in other agencies throughout the world, and as I have over the past couple of months, uh, particularly at, um, after we hosted the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan re reconstruction and and leading up to this, um, they express concern that. That, uh, that that Congress might get the wrong message uh, out of uh, your effort and of CIGAR's effort, um, which is that um, the development agencies are just doing it wrong, they're bad at this, and that they should just be, you know, they should lose further support and funding. Um, and, you know, when they, a lot of times when they speak in public and, and you read their reports, it's, yeah, it can be a little bit um, overly optimistic. Um, but then when you talk to them in sort of off the record, um, you know, context. Generally speaking, they recognize that there there are problems with the, with the data calls. There are problems with planning and and so on. Um, but they also point out that that they're being asked to um, to spend more money than they can possibly um, spend. A lot of cases, um, far more than they asked for. They're being sent out into environments in which they really don't have adequate training. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't have the same level of support uh, for their families that the military has. Um, there's a whole host of, uh, of other issues surrounding the lack of support that civilians involved in these efforts um, get 
um, from you know congressional meddling to you know into how they write their contracts all the way um, through how they're chosen for deployment and how they're chosen for um, for promotion that just constrains the ability that they're able to do. Now that doesn't you know forgive some of the other uh, sins along the way of some bad decisions that they themselves make as well. Um, but I just wanted to, to pose to you and and perhaps to to the rest of the panel as well. Um, uh, what can we say, sort of, in defense of of, of the development world? Um, you know, should we be learning the should should the lesson be that they need less support, or should the lesson be that we need to not only do they need to reform themselves, but we need to figure out what sorts of support to give the civilians that we're sending out to these difficult environments? I don't have a lot of sympathy for the not the development world because the people I've met in the field. I have a great deal of admiration for. But it wasn't that somehow the Congress woke up one morning and threw money at the development world. Somebody went out in the development structure and asked for it. And people piled on in shaping the requests that came for Iraq, uh, but they weren't people from the outside it became almost a bidding contest as to how you could get down the list and create sort of the request that would meet everybody's dream. Uh, and in the process, had the people worried a lot more about absorption capability, if they'd had the capability to actually do economic planning, which is one of the things we have absolutely zero branch for in the United States government, something that we basically dropped about the time we formed the World Bank, we might have had more realistic goals. I think the problem basically here is if you had a planning staff somewhere in state and U.S. aid, it would really help. You don't have a planning staff in either one. You have groups that can draft PowerPoints and conceptual view graphs. They're not what Stuart was talking about. They're not capable of doing detailed planning. All you have to do is look at the econometric data they're using and the gaps between that and the World Bank and virtually any real expertise. The community is a very serious problem in terms of basic competence the moment you go beyond program level aid. It is compounded, I think, by politicizing, building up, spinning the image, regardless of whether it's really needed, ignoring absorption capability. You know, we often point out that in the case of Iraq, uh, you disbanded the military. In Afghanistan, we managed to do something even better. We disbanded the remnants of the Afghan civil service by buying virtually everybody out of the professional structure and putting them into aid-funded projects, leaving no core capability within the Afghan civil service. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I think that it is a very serious time for a lot better top-level leadership and really serious reform. And I'll just add on, Iraq has presented another important issue that the Hill has engaged in somewhat, and that is delegation of governmental duties, uh, particularly in the security sector. The unprecedented scope of security engagement in, by private contractors in Iraq that led to some problems that, that had to be resolved, and the Commission on Wartime Contracting addressed it. Uh, but I think also it's a time maybe, as, as Tony said, to look at aid and look at how much is contracted out of their work and how much is actually done by the U.S. Agency for International Development personnel. Now, I've heard 80 percent is contracted out. Uh, and and is that, does that make sense? I don't know. I'm not an expert. Uh, but, but, does it, is, but I guess regarding standing de standard development, I don't know. But, but what about AIDS activity in a stabilization and reconstruction operation? That's a different context. And the planning and the execution ought to be rethought with, with regard to how much is contracted out of the use of that kind of money in an SRO. Uh, let me take um, uh, one final question. I'll take two final questions. Um, and then I'd like to ask the, um, everyone on the panel to uh, offer some final thoughts. 
um, here in the front. Hi, my name is Mark Corman. I work for the Canadian it's fine. Embassy. And uh, my question was, what roles does online information play in improving transparency and accountability? And how can social media or data assist with consulting between military and civilian operations? Um, and one additional question, please, um, in the back row, please. Eric Walter Storff, and I'm an independent analyst. We're having um, a one-sided conversation. How can we set up uh, governance and accountability structures in which we're getting direct feedback from people in the country, whether it's elites or other interests in the country, um, to be able to flesh out this conversation? So the two questions are, um, how can we Im improve uh, accountability, um, but, but uh, getting information from the people in the country themselves, and then also how can the internet and social media be used um, to improve transparency? Let me take the second one. Uh, we went through a very strange sequence in Iraq. The State Department first wanted to have a maturity model to prove that they'd succeeded in developing Iraq. At that point, Iraq ranked 160th per capita income in the world. Then, when that was pointed out, this was observed, they went to a maturity model, and then they started looking for metrics. They ended up with a very long period of gestation, so they eventually ended up with a Gallup proposal that we poll people in country to look at what had happened by way of development. And by the time that that model was created, interest had dropped and it was never actually implemented. Polling can help, but polling has very serious limitations, even when it's done right. And since the United States government never puts the control questions or the whole poll in any of its reporting, it is one of the basic problems that if you don't have transparency in the poll, you can't trust what is almost invariably a selective product taken out of the poll to justify whatever anybody is doing already. You also need the kind of interviews that Stewart did, and you need to balance it out with metrics, because one thing we have learned, when you actually try to figure out what people's perceptions are, you have to consider who they are, how divided they are, and what their special interests are, and national averages or national polls of developing countries are models of irrelevance because you can't figure out who thinks what, where, for what reason. And at the end of it, you don't have any priorities for actually acting. Now, there are models that were sort of halfway developed that got us almost to the point where this might have been done at Iraq if state had ever funded it, but it didn't. Looking at Afghanistan, we have now gone through something like 14 different models to try to figure out how to actually get progress by district. Unfortunately, a lot of the models aren't producing positive signs of improvement, and therefore they're never going to be declassified. And let me again say, zero transparency, zero ability to manage. Uh, which unfortunately brings me to some of the social networking. You know, the problem is you can't twit, and I am pronouncing the term properly. Uh, you can't blog your way into highly sophisticated models of what goes on in a given country. This is a matter, you know, for grown adults who actually can be operational rather than either superannuated couch potatoes <laughs> or graduate students in desperate search of some kind of publication. Um, Ray, would you like to offer some? Uh, what oh, do I we have? can follow that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 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 Thank you for coming. How many graduate students in search of a thesis topic we have here? <laughs> um, 
kind of disheartening, all of this discussion this afternoon. Um, I'm remembering a moment when one of my trips to Iraq, uh, we were talking about a situation. I was with the Deputy Secretary, actually, uh, and the question was, well, we've got to, uh, we've got a contract here for creating, buying manhole covers for a particular town. And I made what I thought was a sensible remark. Well, do you mean we can't make manhole covers here in Iraq? Because the contract was going to go to a Chicago company. And someone said, well, actually, we do make manhole covers here in Iraq, but we have to buy from an American company. I guess my point is that uh, whether it's executive branch or the legislative branch or some combination thereof, uh, we put non-common sense instructions and directions into our situation on the ground, which doesn't help at all. Um, I do want to make one final comment. When governments, state, local, federal, do construction or reconstruction, waste is inevitable. I can remember that wonderful project in Boston called the Big Dig. And I can remember that the mayor and governor made a comment, I think, saying the estimate is going to be $2 billion. And when it was all over and done with, it was $9 billion. That's construction in Boston. Doing construction in a war zone doing construction where you're getting shot at, doing construction when the estimate of a budget must contain 25% value for security is a different kettle of fish. We also do not have a federal acquisition regulation for overseas contingency contracting, which I think you've testified to, I've testified to, is something that we need. It is different from buying things on Pennsylvania Avenue than buying things in Kabul or Kandahar or Baghdad or Bagram. And we need to recognize that. Uh, we haven't done a very good job uh, in learning our lessons as we have learned this afternoon. I read a recent um, book review in The Economist about a new book on Iraq by a fellow named Toby Dodge. And the, uh, the author of the review went through a series of uh, remarks about the book and how we got to where we are today. Uh, but I'm looking at, at the article here. And the last paragraph begins, it's a tale worthy of Shakespeare and its conclusion remains to be written. Tony, I don't know how you could top your last comment, but have you got any additional thoughts? <laughs> I don't want somebody to steal my thesis topic. <laughs> Stuart. Well, thank you, Bob. I just want to say it's, it's an honor to be here at CSIS again and to be with my friends Ray and Tony and you, Bob, and, and thanks also to John Hamry. Uh, and and last, thank you all for for being here. And if if you read uh, Learning from Iraq, I'd I'd love to, I hope you will, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, speaking of democratizing the response, you know uh, you can find me at www.sigr.mil for about six more months. And uh, and if you have some good ideas about, as I said, this this um, straw man argument can be strengthened, then I'd love to hear them uh, because. Uh, I think we all agree that where we are is not where we need to be. We need to make progress because this is a crucial national security issue that all Americans should be interested in. And, and uh, so I hope all of you will, will um, in responding, um, get back to me and, and uh, give me some ideas of how we can improve it. So thank you. And of course, our program will continue to be following these issues. You can find us on c3.csis.org. Thank you all for being here tonight.